Today's topic is part of a series of Ask the Expert panel, how SLP and OTPT can collaborate to implement a full prevention clinical programs. Uh, my name is John Telfik. I'm the Senior Manager of Clinical Services, and I'll be today's uh, session moderator. Um, all right, so that's the introduction, and now I'd like to introduce our speakers. So we have as our panel members, Alyssa Bryant, who's one of our clinical program consultants uh, and OT clinician, so representing the voice of occupational therapists. Um, Christopher Newby, uh, physical therapist. I should say Alyssa is from the Georgia, Alabama. Uh, do you venture into Florida as well, uh, I believe, a Alyssa? Bit. A little bit? Okay. Yeah. Chris in Western Pennsylvania. Chris is a physical therapist and many years of experience with ACP and also serves as a clinical program consultant. And Rebecca Clickerman, who is our speech language pathologist. Uh, Rebecca is in the Eastern Zone, uh, also geographically located in Pennsylvania, so covering the Northeast uh, and representing the voice of our SLP colleagues. So with that, I will turn it over to Alyssa. Alyssa, take it away. Great, thank you so much, John, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, as John mentioned, I am an occupational therapist. I am pleased to represent the uh, Deep South here today. Uh, I've been an OT for the last, oh gosh, 19 years, I believe it is. It pains me a little bit to say that. I was trained in the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, but live now in uh, Alabama. Um, I do want to just add real quick, there's a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to fall prevention and fall prevention programming. So as we move through, please do not hesitate to use the chat and Q&A features to toss out things so that we make sure we're addressing topics that are relevant to you and what you're going through right now. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll just keep on going on. So let me toss it over to you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so I'm Chris Newby. I'm a British trained physiotherapist who's worked in the States for 25 years. And for the last 16, I've been a clinical program consultant with ACP in Northwest Pennsylvania. Um, before I pass it over to Rebecca, I just want to remind everyone that Rebecca, Alyssa and myself have presented a series of webinars on SLP collaboration with OT and PT. We did four on specific treatment interventions, one on eSTEM, one on ultrasound and diathermy, one on biofeedback equipment, and one on exercise equipment. We've also done uh, two on programming, um, which uh, preceded this one. So in order that we don't uh, duplicate everything that we have covered and take up too much time uh, with non-specific full information, uh, when I pass it over to Rebecca, I'm going to have Rebecca summarize the general points that we've already covered on how SLP can help OT and PT uh, provide a more effective treatment on a general point, and also how OT and PT can leverage their speech and vice versa to make everything a much more multidisciplinary approach. The other thing I want to quickly add is that um, for prevention programs are typically composed of interventions designed to address the physical impairments that result in people having a fall. Uh, but what often is forgotten um, is the importance of the role of SLP in trying to get to the bottom of why it is that somebody is actually having their fall and balance issues. And because Rebecca also has a behavioralist background, we're going to leverage her in some of those discussions a little bit later. I do want to point out uh, that one of the um, issues that sometimes OTs and PTs forget uh, to address is the fact that when you're doing fall and balance rehabilitation, you need to actually have the individual who now has a history of having falls and balance issues to actually do some kind of activity that results in them losing their balance. And this can be something that often the patient or the resident themselves does not want to do. And very often, if we're not careful as OTs and PTs, we don't want to do that to them either. One of the ways in which SLP can help is preload all of these interventions that we're going to be doing by discussing it with that particular uh, resident or patient so that they understand why they're being, being put in what they might think is an unsafe situation, but which in actual fact is a very safe situation because they're working with qualified clinicians. 
So um, that's another reason why if somebody is going to be placed on a falls and balance program, SLP needs to be notified in order that they can provide the screening and if necessary, the extra information. So I apologize for that long introduction, but Rebecca, if you would like to start off by just summarizing what we've discussed in our previous webinars. Thank you, Chris. I thought that was a perfect introduction. Uh, so yes, I'm Rebecca Clickerman. I am a speech language pathologist. And uh, as Chris uh, mentioned, I do have a behaviorist background. So we're gonna talk about why a lot today. <laughs> um, I really love being a part of this panel. Um, I think we provided a lot of information in our previous webinars. So as Chris mentioned, we don't wanna keep reviewing the same information, but the gist of um, what we've provided has really been, you know, SLPs provide just a different perspective and a different background to approach um, programming, um, approach use of uh, equipment. Um, really, that starts with just ensuring that your SLP is a part of the screen, at least screening process, if you're initiating programming with any of your residents. Um, I know that you might have an SLP who may respond with, well, that's false. How does that really relate to me? Um, so I'm glad that you're joining us today. Hopefully, you'll have some takeaways to share with that SLP if they're not really familiar with participating in programming. Um, but as Chris mentioned, you know, programming is much more than just, you know, exercise and training routine. There's so much that goes into uh, cognition, language, communication um, in promoting success of these programs. So I encourage you to have your SLPs participate um, in the screening process if you have a resident identified for any program. Um, also encouraging them to observe a session, especially if it's um, for use with eSTEM or um, I know we've discussed the VR as well, um, or even just, you know, this is typically how I train um, you know, sit to stand transfers or, or whatever you're training with your resident, it might be helpful to have your SLP observe. Um, something that we've reviewed multiple times on here is, um, you know, we all get into a routine of how we provide treatment, especially if it's sort of repetitive. Um, and sometimes we forget to take into consideration um, all of our residents' needs. And we always need to look at our resident, you know, as that whole person. Um, so, you know, your SLP may observe and be able to give you um, some feedback regarding effective communication strategies, um, especially right now when we're all masked up and um, have layers of PPE and, um, you know, many of our residents have hearing impairments, maybe cognitive impairments. So, you know, making sure you're facing the resident, making sure you're uh, speaking in one utterance at a time. Um, does this resident require maybe a binary choice or, um, you know, just as yes, no response. Um, do they require those options in order to pro provide an answer? Um, many of our residents um, become um, shaped to respond to um, our <laughs> commands a certain way. So they may be um, just responding with okay or yes, um, just out of habit because that's what we've shaped their behavior to be. Um, and they're not actually accurately responding to the questions that we're asking. Um, so it's really important that um, your SLP give you clues as to, you know, this is an effective way to ask this resident a question or, you know, their expressive um, language is much weaker than their receptive. So they may need um, visual cues um, and supports um, in order to understand. Um, or their, their expressive language is not very reliable, so um, we need to provide them a way to answer 
questions or request assistance, things like that, a different way other than using speech. Um, so things like that are really important to consider um, because sometimes we have these residents who are overly compliant um, and really maybe don't understand or not getting the full benefit um, or full success of that programming. Or we might have on the other end, those residents that we um, unfortunately dub as non-compliant. Um, and I am a big fan of, of the um, saying, you know, if, if somebody's not learning the way you teach, you have to change the way you teach. Um, and that's very true with any of the programming we provide to our residents. If they are, you know, non-compliant or not willing to participate um, in a program that's likely going to benefit them, we need to um, explain to them and provide the appropriate supports to facilitate their understanding. Um, and this is true with cognitively impaired patients, patients with dementia, that we really can provide um, support and training, and especially if, if your SLP is involved, we could be working on that um, during a skilled session um, to facilitate that understanding and ensure that the resident is understanding what's required, the rationale behind it is very important. Um, sometimes we forget to provide that to our residents. Um, and ensuring that they have the communication skills, the understanding um, cognitive skills uh, really necessary in order to um, participate in that program. So really encourage you to go um, listen to some of those other recorded webinars that we've covered um, that information. I'll, I'll, may I jump in and um, yes, thank you for that summary, Rebecca, and that introduction, Alyssa and Chris. So I'm kind of taking a bit of notes here and, and to, to highlight these points. So just because it's a fall prevention program that we're focusing on today, it does not mean that um, there is not a role for the interdisciplinary team to contribute, including SLPs, even though that may sound just off the top, oh, that's more of leg strengthening or balance. It's, um, it's all about physical therapy. So there's a certain role for OT and SLP to play. Um, considering the patient from a holistic approach, consider the communication uh, abilities and the cognitive skills of the patient in order to be um, compliant or, or more to really um, up the term, if you will, the, the non-compliance piece is put negative connotation on the patient is just not listening to the expert clinician. Uh, but you see now throughout the literature, they talk about adherence. Uh, so, Rebecca, it's an excellent point that you make, that it's uh, really not about that the patient is not um, cooperating or contributing, but perhaps it is the way that they're receiving the instruction, if they're fully understanding what they're being asked to do, or perhaps even are they motivated because the therapist needing to leverage different communication skills and techniques for them to be fully engaged as part of the rehab program. Is that a, a good summary, but verbose as well? Uh, you know, to yes. to um, luckily I, for I, all I, of our audience, we have four verbose. No, I'm all right, <laughs> very good. <laughs> um, Alyssa, do you take it away from here? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Sean, and I I agree that was an excellent uh, summary. So I forgot to mention earlier, I did want to just remind everybody that uh, historically, the first day of fall is um, National Fall Prevention Awareness Day. Um, and I do believe that this year, for the first time, the National Council on Aging is doing national, is recognizing National Fall Prevention Awareness Week, which happens to be next week. So hopefully, um, you know, this is part of your plan to do some fun advocacy and um, programming enhancements and awareness in your facilities. Uh, my guess is that as healthcare providers, right, we're, we're pretty much aware that falls are an issue. We don't need to be convinced that fall prevention programming is needed out there by any means. Uh, but what you, what you may not know, or at least you may not recall, is that falls are the leading cause of injury and accidental death in older adults. I was actually surprised to uh, realize that within the United States, mortality rates in older adults um, have actually increased 30 percent uh, between the year 2007 and 2016. So not just falls and injuries, but mortality rates as well. So definitely something we need to be addressing. 
And to my lovely colleagues' points, um, you know, fall prevention programming can have some uh, obstacles, especially when you have patients with cognitive uh, issues. Uh, once you add dementia into the mix, right, patients with dementia are two to three times, uh, have a greater, two to three times greater risk of falling than somebody without dementia. And, you know, depending on the source that you look, like half of nursing facility residents have dementia to some degree. Uh, so that we know, we know, right, falls are bad. Uh, but we also have to recognize the importance of the fear of falling. Uh, there was a study done in 2016 that identified um, fear of falling avoidance behaviors and balanced confidence as actually being the most predictive for future falls, uh, which is huge. And granted, that is just one study, uh, but certainly providing a suggestion that the patient themselves may actually have, you know, a better sense as to their fall risk than what we can get from an objective measure. We still use those objective measures, but there are also some that recognize balanced confidence and fear of falling. And it doesn't take a fall to become fearful of that, right? And as clinicians, we're, we're well versed in that once somebody's fearful, they isolate themselves, they have a more sedentary lifestyle, and then some of those, you know, other more physical issues do become a greater issue, weakness, range of motion, and the potential for isolation and furthering of cognitive decline is there is real as well. Now, in working with my um, ACP partners over the last, you know, several years, it's certainly been brought to my attention that fall programming is difficult, right? It's challenging. And a lot of the uh, clinicians that I've worked with, you know, they get a little frustrated because of, you know, sometimes it can feel like the interventions you're putting in place are not working. And I'm hoping that, you know, you can walk away from today feeling in energized and inspired that it, it's Fall interventions really do work, uh, but to my colleague's point earlier, we need to make sure that we are providing interventions that are person-centered, um, but are also from an entire interdisciplinary team and are considered um, multifactorial, right? We can't just look at one or what somebody might call like a single mode intervention. I'm going to strengthen them. We have to uh, assess everybody in that interdisciplinary team needs to assess each individual patient um, and they need to identify all of the risk factors. And then we wanna to try to address as many of those modifiable risk factors as possible. So if y'all will bear with me for a second here, I'm gonna share my screen just to kind of flash up really quick. The, um, sorry, I got off the slide and I didn't realize it the fall prevention risk factors. So these are your intrinsic, extrinsic risk factors for falls. And I thought this is a great stepping off point since we have um, SLP on our panel today to highlight that cognitive impairment is one of those listed intrinsic factors. And cognitive impairment, um, although I've worked with a lot of clinicians who consider this non-modifiable, it is not necessarily a non-modifiable risk factor. In fact, in many cases, it is modifiable, and that's where we need to really make sure we're leveraging our entire interdisciplinary team and our speech therapists especially um, to help address, identify, and address those cognitive issues. All right, let me stop sharing. And um, Rebecca, you have anything you want to add? Yes, thank you. I thought that was wonderful. Um, I, I love that you're highlighting the cognitive impairment uh, component um, of falls. Um, and we do know that older adults with moderate to severe cognitive impairment um, have a much higher um, risk of falls with an incidence of between 60 and 80%. Um, so it's very much a, a risk factor um, if your resident has any level of cognitive impairment, um, they are more likely to have a fall. Um, and again, talking about that why, um, and I love that um, you were speaking to, you know, we can't just address one component. So we can't just make them stronger. We can't just improve their balance. Um, if it's um, really the cause that um, they can't 
appropriately use their call bells to request assistance to get out of bed, it doesn't matter how strong or balanced they are, they're going to continuously attempt to get out of bed um, and most likely have a fall. So I'm um, really looking at all of those factors that are um, contributing to that fall risk is really important. And it is going to take the entire team. Um, you know, and I love that you spoke that it is considered non-modifiable. And unfortunately, you know, there are cases where I think um, residents are viewed with having either dementia or cognitive impairment and it's um, brushed aside um, and that resident's not necessarily picked up for a skill treatment because the attitude might be, well, we can't really address that. We can't change that. But there are certainly interventions that we can provide to improve um, that resident's understanding, their, their performance. Um, obviously, we can address um, areas of concern and areas of need. Um, again, why it's really important for your SLPs to be involved. But, you know, again, going back to that call bell uh, light, uh, call bell light, what am I saying? Sorry, it's Friday. Um, call, call bell issue. Um, you know, is it, and we've all been in that residence room where, um, it, you know, they have the call bell, um, they that resident doesn't understand that if they hit that, it's going to light up out in the hallway that somebody, you know, staff member is going to pass and, you know, provide assistance. Um, and there are so many levels where that breakdown could occur. It could occur where the call bell is not within reach or they have upper extremity impairment. So, you know, OT um, may need to provide, you know, a different type of, of call bell. Maybe they need, you know, a big button or something, or it needs to be placed differently. Um, and, and more of it, it's a grosser fine motor concern. Um, but, you know, do, even if you can get them to activate that call bell, um, are they going to understand that before I get out of bed, I, I attempt to get out of bed, I need to use my call bell. Um, so this is really something that OT could address and speech could address. So um, is it that the resident under, you know, doesn't understand that they need, that they require assistance and we need to train um, their understanding of that rationale of why they need um, assistance? Um, is it um, that they can't, maybe it's a, a resident with aphasia or apraxia, so they can't verbalize what they need. So maybe they hit the call bell, somebody comes in and they can't effectively verbalize what they need. And so somebody's assuming, well, they hit it by accident or they just keep continuously hitting their call bell. So now, now they're the boy that, who cried wolf and I'm gonna kind of maybe not take it as seriously. Um, so maybe speech needs to provide some sort of um, AAC um, where the resident just has a choice of, you know, four or six um, possible um, areas of, of need that they could, you know, identify when somebody comes in the room. So there is a lot of training that could go into that. Um, you know, is it that this resident can need it? Um, can they follow a routine? Um, many of our residents may be in these day-to-day um, -day very um, structured types of daily routines and activities, it seems like they can follow multi-step directions. Um, but really when you provide them something novel, they cannot, they have a breakdown and they can't follow, you know, even a two-step direction. Um, so this additionally would be something that speech could address where, um, you know, we could help train that sequencing. We could see um, if they can put those steps in order, if they can identify um, what supports um, are needed. Um, so there is a lot of collaboration that we as SLPs could provide with PT and OT um, to ensure success. But again, it's really more important um, to figure out why this is happening than um, just looking at it as, as okay, they fell. Um, we don't want them to injure themselves, or as Alyssa brought up, you know, this increases mortality rates, um, and we just need them to exercise and build strength. Um, that's really not going to address the the real cause. 
Um, so making sure that um, the SLP is maybe providing any um, input regarding communication, regarding cognition, um, and assisting in breaking down um, why that behavior is occurring. So when I was a student therapist, one of the lessons I learned from an experienced clinician was that one of our jobs as therapists is to create an environment where it is safe for our patients to fail because only then can we truly find out what it is they're having difficulty and problems with. And speaking just as a, as a PT now, um, one of the benefits of having SLP involved is that if you're trying to get your patient to do something that they intuitively or inherently don't want to do because they know they will fail, you can have your SLP preload that by talking through what's going to happen in the PT and OT session and explain why it's important that they actually do put themselves in a position where they may have a minor loss of balance because that's the only way we can actually find out what's truly going on. I have a sports background and uh, one of the cliches in sports is that you never get any better by not practicing the things you're not good at. So if you don't practice the things you're struggling with, you're not going to get any better at them. And in indeed, if you're not careful, you start avoiding those things and you start actually diminishing your level of activity. The other thing you learn from a sports background is that most sportsmen and women believe they're as good as their last game or their last match, whereas in actual fact, they're only as good as their next one. So another way in which SLP can help is actually preload the treatment where you're going to be advancing what you're going to be doing with that patient or that resident. Also, please remember as well that the elderly population are not just older versions of ourselves, they're changed versions of ourselves. As you get older, lots of things alter. Um, processing becomes more difficult. You can't multitask quite as easily. Um, it may take you longer to actually assimilate information. You might require a different way to have that message. And remember, you don't have to have cognitive impairment to have some of those changes. Also, before I hand it back to Alyssa, I also want to point out that some of the specific interventions that PT and OT may offer are designed to challenge their patients. So for example, visual input is really important in, in balance. If you diminish their vision by, for example, asking them to put sunglasses on when they're inside in order that you can now see how much they're over relying on their vision, if the patient doesn't understand that, you're not going to get um, uh, the full benefit of that intervention. So letting your speech path know what kind of interventions you are going to be attempting in order that they can help prepare the patient for that. Remember, if you're going to talk your patient through about what you're going to do in two minutes time, that doesn't give them a lot of opportunity to process and assimilate. If that's done earlier in the day or the day before by speech path, your resident is much more likely to be able to give everything that they can to help you help them. And the last thing I want to mention before I pass it to Alyssa is that when you're working with the elderly, especially if you have assisted living and independent living as well as long-term care residents, you may discover that your resident is not being 100% open about some of the problems they have because they may be fearful that if they admit to problems, things will be taken away from them or they'll no longer be able to do things. And this is especially true if they're living in independent or assisted living. So again, speech path can help not only allay some of those fears, but can also actually encourage the, the resident to be able to be much more open about some of the difficulties that they're uh, experiencing and explain that we will do everything we can as a multidisciplinary team to adapt things in order that that resident, if at all possible, can continue to do what it is they'd like to do. And the last thing, uh, Alyssa, which I'd like you to comment on, uh, uh, if you don't mind, is that we're talking about falls and balance here as if we're talking exclusively about standing up. But please remember, a lot of residents suffer falls and balance issues from being in the seated position. Alyssa? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a, a great segue, actually, because posture is one of the things that I just wrote down I wanted to discuss. Um, before I do that, I, I also wanted to thank you for bringing up the uh, importance of 
you know, making patients a little uncomfortable, um, the importance of failure. It, we spend a lot of time in a lot of therapy gyms and see a lot of treatment. And this is an area where, you know, I feel as, as, as clinicians, we could definitely um, have some room to improve, right? Where we can push these patients a little bit further. And when exercise and balance training and those things are appropriate as part of their fall prevention program, you know, we really do need to work on pointing uh, working to that point of failure and increasing the intensity, you know, reaching just a little bit further. Uh, so, you know, you may have in your facility the opportunity to use things like the Omni Stand or the Omni VR that can help to, you know, incrementally progress those activities. Um, with a little bit, uh, you know, more opportunities for objective measures as you move forward. But even if you don't have that type of technology, um, you know, we, we do need to focus on the intensity of whatever it is the patient is doing, being asked to do. Um, and then posture, you know, as an occupational therapist, I have had other OTs, you know, you know, question, oh, my role in fall prevention programming. And um, we can't underestimate the importance of uh, thoracic, uh, head on neck posture, uh, whether it's to Chris's point in a seated or a standing position. You know, in a standing position, that's going to have a significant impact on one center of gravity and it will affect all of their gait, all of their mobility as they move forward. Uh, but in a seated position as well. I mean, there's some uh, research that suggests um, individuals with cognitive decline have uh, greater limitations in postural stability. Um, from what I've personally read, and you know, it's, it's questionable as to which plane, but uh, specifically lateral oscillations can make a, it can be a little bit more challenging, potentially a little bit more challenging for patients with cognitive decline. So making sure that we are um, working not with just with PT for seating and positioning, but also with our, um, our SLPs for head and neck posture and how that's going to have an impact on um, you know, breathing. We've got to breathe when we're when we're walking and when we're reaching. And these are all things that are going to have a, an impact on one's fall risk. Uh, this can also have an impact on um, nutrition and dehydration. And I was actually hoping that Rebecca might have a little bit more to add there as well, because there's certainly some um, some links to uh, inadequate nutrition that can have a negative impact on one's fall risk as well. Rebecca, you have anything you can? You segued perfectly, Alyssa. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll start there and then I'll kind of work my way back. Um, absolutely. So we know that, um, I know you were just talking about uh, seated position and posture, but I'm going to go back just a, um, a little bit and talk about uh, gait um, with our, uh, residents who are at risk for, for falls, we know that a change in gait can indicate a change in cognition, um, and a change in cognition may result in that change in gait. So we know that there's this interrelatedness between the two. Um, so this is just highlighting that, um, for SLPs, we may not be aware that if we're seeing a change in cognition, it could indicate that, oh, we need to refer to OTPT. Same thing if we see a change in their posture or um, postural impairment that's impacting their um, breathing or their swallowing, making sure that we're referring to one another is really important. Um, but for um, all staff, if we do see that change in cognition, or again, if we see a change in, in gait that may indicate a change in cognition, Looking at hydration and nutrition for that resident is really important. We know that dehydration um, can absolutely cause cognitive changes. So looking at how um, acute is this cognitive change? Was it gradual? Was it a more rapid onset? What is their intake? Is that intake being uh, captured accurately? Um, for the SLPs out there looking at, you know, is this resident on thickened liquids or a modified diet that can have a significant impact on hydration and nutrition? 
Um, altered diets do not contain the same nutrition that regular diets have. Um, and we know that residents on thickened liquids are much more likely to um, become dehydrated than those receiving um, thin liquids. So always important to look at, again, that holistic view of the patient, always um, important that if we do see any of those cognitive changes that we are always going back and looking at, at nutrition and hydration. And I'm so glad Alyssa brought that up. Um, that is absolutely one area that that speech should be looking at and, and screening anytime that um, these changes are noticed with our residents. Um, and along with that, you know, discussing about making sure that we're referring to one another if we do see changes or concerns. Um, it's always uh, great to co-treat when we can. And I think that there are a lot of missed opportunities um, for co-treatment, um, especially, in, you know, between um, SLP and PT, SLP and OT. Um, and I know that the, the bulk of our participants today um, reported, you know, maybe not the most frequent collaboration, um, but I really think, especially as Alyssa brought up, you know, the VR, the Omni stand, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for SLPs to collaborate, especially with um, our residents who um, may also have attentional uh, deficits that, and maybe that's um, one of the risk factors for falls. Um, so while they're working on these exercise and balance, um, activities, can we also address some attention? So can they um, continue with that, that physical intervention um, that may be demanding and challenging? And then what cognitive, attentional, um, and communication strategies can we work on and introduce so that we can work on that divided attention for that resident? Um, that's something really important, especially the falls that we know that a lot of our res residents have attentional deficits. Um, and so again, if we're all working on all of these um, deficits discreetly, um, they may ha have, you know, great outcomes um, if we're all working on them individually, but when the resident is really tasked in the real world to combine everything in a distracting environment and have to focus their attention um, and maybe even communicate, maybe that's a challenge for them, that's where that breakdown occurs. Um, so it's not really going to result in a true functional gain if we're not building toward a more uh, naturalistic environment. So that opportunity for co-treatment is really important. Um, and again, you know, it can't hurt either if we're repeating um, the sequencing, the strategies uh, across people, uh, um, across environments, we know that's only going to facilitate understanding and generalization of those skills. So it's really um, important that all members of the interdisciplinary team, and this includes nursing and caregivers, um, understand, you know, if what a protocol or an intervention requires and that we can all reinforce um, and target um, that understanding and those skills across the board. But yes, if, if we can wrap up with kind of um, summation points from each of you, I love how you've kind of connected the relationship between all those interplays and in interconnected factors that are often addressed by the multidiscipline. Um, something Rebecca said resonates with me and I wanna just uh, repeat it briefly here is that, you know, the, the relationship between how gate deficits may be cognitive deficits or, or vice versa. So kind of considering that as you're assessing that patient. Um, so yeah, so, so summation points or, um, as we close today's webinar. So um, what I would like to, to remind everybody is that uh, until we had YouTube, nobody woke up in the morning with the expressed intent of doing something stupid. Um, so if a resident is not following instructions or is doing something that is somewhat unsafe, then we need to find out why. And that's where your SLP can be absolutely invaluable. Is it that they keep forgetting their safety precautions and they need to be taught or explained a different way? Are they agitated and they need help with distraction? Uh, do they need a busy box or whatever you want to call it? Um, are they having problems understanding or remembering something that's changed because for the last 60 years, they've done something the same way? 
So again, as a PT or as an OT, if you haven't involved your SLP with these falls and balance issues, it's absolutely important that you do, even if it's only to have SLP screen the resident and to confirm for you that you're already doing everything that's necessary. At least you have that uh, comfort in knowing that you're already providing everything. Excellent. Alyssa? Uh, you know, I just happen to have this right in front of me. So to just drive um, Rebecca's point home even more, it has been suggested in the literature that um, gait changes can act as a biomarker for the future development of cognitive decline. And that's really not a perspective that we typically um, think through and work through um, in when we're working with our patients. So several different studies have shown Net neurologic gait abnormalities uh, did have an increased risk of developing dementia and cognitive decline um, six to ten years later on down the road. Uh, so you might want to keep that in mind. Um, and then uh, another one, just to reiterate uh, Rebecca's point, that dual task training has been found to improve gait, improve balance, as well as to improve cognition in our elderly patients. So um, you know, look having that holistic approach and um, working with our colleagues to make sure that we're addressing this from every angle. Uh, and then I think my final thought um, will be to leave you with assessing how to, how to leave our patients, right? Assessing the five Ps. I like this. I'm sure your facility has some sort of uh, version of this, if not this specifically. But when you leave those patients, uh, making sure that you're assessing pain, their personal needs, uh, their uh, positioning, changing their position if necessary, um, placing all of uh, necessary things in place, right? Do they have their water? Do they have their call light, uh, their cell phone, whatever is important to them, um, and uh, prevent falls by making sure that not just the patient, but their family, their loved ones, and everyone that's around them are doing things to support them and keep them safe. Wonderful. Thanks, Alyssa. And you stole my thunder. I was going to mention a dual task training piece. Uh, since since all of our patients uh, never just uh, pay attention to just walking, they typically are um, cognitively engaged in something else, whether it's walking to then reach to the bathroom or to grab something from the cupboard or to uh, look on the shelf right and left. So so these are absolutely essential to really make it functionally meaningful for our patients. Fantastic. And Rebecca, any additional closing thoughts? No, and I, again, I was just going to say exactly what Alyssa said right there at the end with the <laughs> dual task training. So that's perfect. Um, and I, but I like the um, the reminder you just provided, and I think that that's I'm going to call SLPs out since we don't really have any today. Um, but it's something I think that SLPs um, could use some reminders of. Um, I think that there are, you know, obviously we do check. Um, you know, fairly frequently positioning and, you know, do they have access to their call bell and everything else. But, you know, I think things like pain, um, I think it's really uh, helpful to review that and making sure that, um, you know, speech is, is doing that as well when we're leaving a patient. Um, I think that that's a helpful reminder for everyone. Um, and again, just speaks to, it's always great to, um, <sighs> have all team members aware of what um, services you're providing and what that's really what that really entails. Um, because I think that there are areas that um, each discipline is um, addresses and that we can contribute to one another. Um, I think that there's um, so much opportunity that um, we don't necessarily take advantage of. Excellent. So yes, I echo the uh really a winning team and a winning approach is, a, is one that is multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, whichever of those two terms you prefer. With that, this webinar is coming to a close. Thank you, everyone.